Hey there, Fiber Junkies. Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Push and Yarns and host of this podcast. Today, I wanted to talk about something that's been on my mind a lot lately and from the online discussions that I have seen, I think it's been on a lot of knitters and crocheters' minds. Um, so you may have noticed that our fiber community is starting to have a lot of infighting and it seems like people are drawing battle lines and picking sides a lot lately and there's just been a lot more um, arguments and angst and online um, discussions that aren't always so civil and that's causing a lot of people to get really frustrated because they see the connections that we've spent years and decades building up with each other starting to dissolve, starting to really come under attack and starting to really divide people and polarize people. It's not just in the knitting world either, it's uh, actually going on all over a world and I think that the uh, fiber community definitely sees that. In fact, many of us have felt the frustration of this was my one last safe space to just connect with people regardless of our differences, to have a common ground, our love of fiber that we can connect over and we can respect each other and leave our differences at the door and just come together over that. And this is our one last safe haven where it feels like even that has gone away lately. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on behind all of these discussions and what can we do about it? If we really do want to see more respect of each other, more love towards each other, and more discussion, what can we do to foster that? So you know that feeling of like tightness in your chest or, in, or that lump in your throat when you're online and you read something? Maybe it's a comment or a post by someone, maybe it's the title of an article, or you see a video that somebody posts and it just gets you so upset. Maybe you're terrified because you see the state of the world and you get so scared that our world is just seems like it's going to hell in a handbasket. Or maybe it's anger and resentment or bitterness because you see people spouting ideas and boldly declaring these opinions that you just are sure are wrong and you feel that anger and resentment. Maybe they're spouting facts and you know that that's not the fact and you need to set them straight. This can be a variety of different things from I'm super offended by that to that's not right, I have to set you straight to, I can't believe you're so stupid to draw that conclusion. What about this X, Y, Z fact? All of those feelings, right, that we get that, that panicky sense that I have to do something right now. I need to say something right now. I have to set this record straight. That is a reactionary response. That is allowing your emotions to sit in the driver's seat and control you. You are no longer in control. Your emotions are in control. We've talked about emotions being tools on the podcast before. My goal with Potion Yarns is to help you create your own magic, and my goal with The Color Cauldron is to help you feel empowered to create the life you desire and to go out and build what you want to see and to promote what you want to see thrive. And one of the ways that we do that is we have to learn that our emotions are tools. They're not good or bad, they're neutral. They are just tools, just like for a carpenter, his tools uh, might be a saw, hammer, nails, etc. None of those things are bad. They can be used for bad or they can be used for good, but they are just his tools to enable him to build what he wants to create, right? Same thing with our emotions. They're there to help us create the life that we desire, to create a life of meaning, but we have to use them appropriately. And just as it would not be a good idea to let the saw just go wild and free and cut whatever it wants, at its own discretion, right? It doesn't have a brain, it can't think for itself, and it, it's probably going to just end up wreaking destruction. You need to be in control of your power tools and not let them just run wild or they'll create a lot of destruction. Same thing with our emotions. When we allow our emotions to be in the driver's seat, we are giving the power to the tools and abdicating our responsibility as the driver. Suddenly, we're not in control. And guess what we all feel when we're not in control? Fear, resentment, anger, we feel um, powerless, which makes us lash out, we feel hurt, we feel overlooked, we feel worried and fearful that our needs are not gonna be met, that what is important to us will not be uh, what's important to everyone around us, and that we won't get what we need. This is all a result of allowing our reactions to just take over. Think about those uh, little faces and uh, the little buttons on Facebook, right? When there's a Facebook post at the bottom, you can give it a thumbs up, you can give it a heart, you can give it a sad face, an angry face, a wow face. Those are literally called reaction buttons because it's just your reaction. What's a reaction? It's like when you go to the doctor and they hit your knee with that little hammer and your leg flies up, right? 
hoping hoping that it flies up and you're healthy and all your your instincts and reactions are correct that's a reaction it's something you don't really control it just it just happens you hit spot a and your leg will pop up our emotions work oftentimes in the same way somebody says something that triggers us to feel a specific way and we feel that way we can't control that we feel that way that that's just it is what it is. It's not good, it's not bad, it just is what it is. That's giving us a clue into how we feel and what we want to see. Sometimes it's good, like, I love that, I agree with that, that's so true, that's so empowering, that's so inspiring. Sometimes it's bad, like, oh, I can't believe that they said this, this makes me feel horrible, I'm so scared for the world that we live in, or I just, I can't, I'm so upset that they would treat someone like this, or that they would say this about someone, or or that they would express this opinion or endorse this political candidate or whoever it is. Those tell us that's just information about how we feel and about how we want the world to be. To react on that initially without pausing to think about it or without um, thinking through our options or analyzing it is reactionary. And this puts us in a very powerless position. We want to be in a place of true power. You hear the word empowerment thrown a lot about in our society, right? Um, what is empowerment? What is it really? True empowerment. I, th I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what that actually is. Empowerment isn't joining a movement. It's not saying the right buzzwords or the right phrases or adopting the right ideology or the right set of rules for a society. It's not endorsing a particular candidate or political movement or joining a religion or it's none of those things. That's not true empowerment. That's honestly giving your power over to those things that you join, to the movement, the ideology, the religion, the political group, whatever it is. True power, true empowerment, authentic power, is maintaining a balance within myself that helps me to avoid acting on my reactions. I will still feel the reactions. I can't help that or control that. And that's not even necessarily how it's supposed to be. Those reactions can be valuable information to me. But I don't need to act on those. I don't let those sit in the driver's seat. I sit in the driver's seat. It's about maintaining balance and avoiding the reactions. There's a little um, analogy here that I wanted to share with you guys. There is a, a picture, a big wheel. Um, let's actually make it the merry-go-round, right? Because most of us played on a merry-go-round as kids probably growing up. Uh, the merry-go-round was my favorite part of the playground when I was a kid, as it was for a lot of my friends. If you hold on to the poles on the very, very edge, you get whipped around when it's going at its absolute fastest. You get whipped around pretty fast. Once you get off of it, you're super dizzy. You can't walk straight, you can't see straight. Everything's a little crazy. Or you can stand in the center when I was a kid, we had this game where um, you would try to get to be the person who stood up in the center because even when it was going at its absolute fastest, the people on the ends would be whipped around, out of control, they're clinging for dear life, they can't sit up straight, much less stand up. But the person in the middle could stand right in the middle with their feet spread about shoulder distance apart and they could go hands free. They didn't even have to hold on to anything. Um, so it was a big thing to like have your hands out. But they're not getting whipped around. They get off, they're not dizzy. They can walk a straight line. They're not the ones puking on the edge of the playground. That's a really good analogy for what life is like because there's always going to be chaos and change in our life. There's always going to be ups and downs. There's always going to be times where everything is shifting so fast and we feel discombobulated and life life just throws curveballs at us constantly that's true for every single person and it not only is impossible to get to the point where that isn't true for you it's not even really healthy the change is what helps us grow and it's important to go through those changes but we can weather the changes a lot better if we're balanced and centered rather than staying on the extremes think about the edges of the merry-go-round as the extreme versions that's adopting an extreme ideology um, even when you wouldn't necessarily think of as extreme. Adopting an ideology, taking a super strong stance on something and not being willing to look at your the alternatives or to reconsider, being um, just absolutely positive that you're right, you've got it figured out and you won't change. And being at the mercy of your emotions puts you on the edge of the circle. If, you're, if you see something and you constantly just react, 
If you post that comment right away, you hit that angry button or that sad face right away, or even that love button right away, and you don't stop and you think through things, and you don't allow yourself to come from a balanced position, you just, whatever your emotions dictate, you do in that exact moment, and you feel that panic, I need to respond right now, I need to take a stand right now, I need to post something right now, I need to answer back right now, that's being on the outside of the merry-go-round where you could easily get flung off and even if you manage to stay on, you can't stand up straight and you're gonna be dizzy and sick. But if you stand in the middle, you're going to be balanced, you're going to be in a much better position to see the world clearly. Now you're not dizzy, you can see straight. You're not puking, you're just fine. That is where we want to be, is the middle of the merry-go-round. When I'm staying balanced, I have control over my thoughts and my emotions. I don't have to just give in to whatever thought comes into my brain, whatever emotion comes into my heart and soul. I don't have to just be at their mercy. I can choose how I'm going to think and feel and what I'm going to act on. Now, I will still have feelings and thoughts that maybe aren't fun or maybe that are, are unpleasant. I'm still going to have reactions like we talked about, but I don't act on those reactions. I allow those to come in as information that I process, but I don't have to act on them. One really good way that you can test whether you're acting on these uh, reactions or whether you're being balanced is to think about how long it takes you to formulate a response. When you see something you don't like on the internet, when you see a comment or a post or the headline of an article or something, what, and you don't like it, what is your reaction? Like what? How long does it take you to hit the react button on Facebook, to post a comment, to say something to the person next to you? That's what I do sometimes. Sometimes I will avoid posting something, but I'll be looking at my phone and my husband's sitting right there and I see something and I'm like, well, can you believe this? And I immediately say something and start ragging on these people that posted this. How often do you do that right away? One of the hallmarks of reactionary explosions is that it's that immediate sense. It is that I gotta say something now, I gotta post something now. There's a sense of urgency. This needs to happen now. And that's one of the biggest lies that we believe is that we have to react right now. And I think that the internet is honestly one of the things pushing that the most because everything in our modern technological age is so instant, right? We have instant everything, we get instant news. There's constant, like something happens and the news cameras are all over it and seven minutes after it happened, we've already got stories and editorials getting posted on Facebook, right? It's crazy how fast information goes in our world. And it's not always a good thing. Fast isn't always better, and in fact, in this case, I think fast is actually acting at our detriment. We need to slow down and take a minute to process things, think through things, and critically analyze things, because posting quickly or commenting quickly or whatever it is, reacting quickly is the hallmark of not being in control, but allowing our emotions and our reactions to control us. Anybody who wants to control you does so through those negative emotions. When you are allowing fear, hatred, resentment, bitterness, hurt, anger, any of those types of emotions that make you feel that angst we talked about in the beginning or that panicky feeling, any of those emotions that make you feel that panic can be used to control you. And the tricky thing is a lot of people in our society are not intentionally trying to control you. They are controlled by their own fear, bitterness, anger, whatever, and they are allowing that to make them wanna control you because they're not in control of themselves, they try to control you. And they won't even realize that that's what they're doing. Maybe you're the one doing that. Maybe you're trying to control other people and it's because you don't feel in control of yourself. So the more that we can work our way back to the center of the wheel, the center of the merry-go-round, the more we can be in control of ourselves and then we don't, we can free the people that we're trying to control. We don't need to be in control of them because we're in control of ourselves and then we want to help other people learn how to control themselves. So how do I do this? What are some practical steps I can take for this? The very first thing that I think it's important to recognize, we kind of touched on this a little bit already, but the very first thing is a saying that has become my life's mantra 
So much so that I got it tattooed on my back. <laughs> I got my very first tattoo about three years ago. My husband and I went and got our first tattoos together for our five year anniversary. And um, he designed them, but we worked together on what went into the design. And I had decided that I really wanted to have something super meaningful for me at that time in my life because I was coming off of a couple of the most tumultuous, scary, and challenging years I have ever endured in my life. And um, I, I'm so glad I went through the experiences because they've changed me into who I'm becoming and I really like who I'm becoming. But going through them was literally like dying and having to be rebirthed. It was incredibly painful and intense and one of the things that I learned about myself during that struggle was I didn't realize how much my life had been controlled by fear how many decisions I made out of fear and worry how many things in my life were controlled by my resentment of feeling powerless or my resentment of other people or the way the world is or any of these other things and learning how to recognize that and let go of the fear, the hatred, the resentment and the anger was so hard but so important for me and it really, it genuinely changed everything about who I was. I felt like a whole new person and it was a long struggle but so important. And it has empowered me to go on to continue to change and face even scarier challenges since. And I'm so grateful for that opportunity. But I wanted to get that incorporated into my tattoo. And the phrase is, beyond fear lies freedom. If I can impart only one thing to you in this video, I want you to take that away from this. Beyond fear lies freedom. Fear is a trap. It's an enslavement. It is going to only create more fear hatred, anger, bitterness, resentment, whenever we feel those kinds of negative feelings and emotions, that, that is coming almost always from a place of fear. You'll find that fear is at the heart of pretty much all of it. And there's another saying that I've heard before that I really like, perfect love drives out fear. That's the antidote, and that's a really, really great way to get started. So first of all, recognize that Reacting is acting on fear. It's coming from a place of fear or a place of resentment or hurt. Um, have you heard the saying, hurt people hurt people? That is so true. And that's what I was getting at a minute ago when we were talking about um, our different negative emotions and how people who are controlled by their own fear or hurt or anger are going to try and control you by utilizing hurt fear, anger, etc. They're going to try to feed off of those fears that you have, those hurt feelings that you have, those bad experiences that you have in order to control you because they're being controlled by that, right? Remember that? So along those same lines, I just want us to take a minute to think about those times when we've reacted that way. What happens usually? I'll share a quick little story from my own life and this is not a make Joe look good story, but it's so important. I, I'm willing to look bad in your eyes because I think it's really important and I want you to understand it. My husband and I have been married for almost eight years and like every couple that has been together for a while, we fight sometimes. As much as we love each other and as awesome as we are together and as much as we love being a team and we know we're committed to each other, we fight and sometimes it gets nasty. And we have been working in our marriage recently on trying to change the way that we fight because we've noticed that there is kind of a trend where... Um, we, one of us will say something nasty or hurtful, um, whether intentionally or not, and the other person will react feeling upset or angry or hurt or whatever, and will, someone will react and um, just kind of fire back another insult or a, a little barb or a dig at, at the other person. Unfortunately, I hate to admit this, but I especially have this tendency. So I've had to recently work on recognizing in the middle of the fight when I'm already upset about not reacting and not just saying the first thing that pops into my head when I feel that hurt or that anger or that fear because I have a really bad habit, even more so than he does, of he says something that hurts my feelings or that makes me angry and I will just say something back, even if it's completely not true. I will make... Um, assumptions about his character that I know aren't true and I will say something that 
like if I was thinking rationally, I would know isn't really the true way that he is or behaves, but I'll just say it in the heat of the moment, or I'll say something that I know is gonna really hurt him and really crush his spirit because I feel hurt. So I lash out and I hurt him back. This almost never goes well for me. Sometimes my husband is super gracious and he sees what's going on and he takes the deep breath and he responds kindly to me even when I'm being horrible. But a lot of the time, he understandably feels incredibly crushed and hurt by my bad reaction and then he'll react back and then I'll react back and then he'll react back and before we know it, we're in World War III. So we are trying to work on slowing down, stopping that reaction before it happens and analyzing how we're feeling and talking more productively and not lashing out because we have realized that hurt breeds more hurt. Fear breeds more fear. Anger creates more anger. All of these things create more of the negative emotions, create more of the chaos, create more of the misunderstandings and the division and the polarization. The only thing that can actually bring resolution when that is happening is love and respect for each other. Love breeds more love. It is almost impossible when someone reaches out to you in genuine love and is caring and kind and expresses love for you, it is almost impossible, if not impossible, to continue to lash out and hurt them and react. Now, I don't wanna say it's completely impossible because we've all had that experience where we tried to do the right thing and be kind to someone and they were just so hurt that they couldn't stop lashing out. Sometimes it's because they recognize that you're doing the better thing and they're embarrassed so they just keep lashing out because they don't know how to stop it. So. Obviously, it's not completely impossible, but in the long term, I think it is. In the long term, if you keep that up, they can only keep going so long before they're going to just give up and walk away or turn back to you and re react in love as well. Love always breeds more love. Kindness and compassion breed kindness and compassion. Trust inspires trust. These are the kinds of things that we need to have because they will create more of the same thing. For those of you who might not know or might not remember, I am pregnant right now. I'm about six months pregnant. And uh, it's a really common thing, apparently, for pregnant women to have weird, wacky dreams. And it's also particularly common for pregnant women to have dreams about giving birth to non-human species animals, especially domesticated pets like cats and dogs and things. I personally have had multiple dreams where I had the baby in my dream and instead of a human baby I had a kitten because we have three cats and I'm a cat mom already and you know when I think about bestowing love and care and affection on a little baby it's not uncommon to think about it as a cat because that's what I'm already doing I'm already caring for three kittens um, or three babies they're not kittens anymore um, and so that, that makes a lot of sense, but that's a really, really common thing. Even for people that don't have pets, that is a pretty common uh, weird dream that pregnant women have is that they give birth to a dog or a cat or a bunny or something. And uh, so I was thinking about this the other day because I just had one of those dreams again the other night where I brought the baby home and it's a kitten. <laughs> and um, of course, when we're awake and you know we're rational throughout the day, we're like, well, of course I'm not gonna have a cat. Of course I'm not gonna have a puppy. That's literally scientifically impossible. That's not how it works. Humans give birth to humans. Cats give birth to cats. Dogs give birth to dogs, etc. right? We all know that that's how science works. It's actually the same with our emotions and with the energies that we're putting out into the world. If we're putting out hurt, fear, anger, resentment, those things can only breed more hurt, fear, anger, and resentment. You throw out some anger at someone, more than likely it's coming back at you. The only way that we can create love is to give out love. Love gives birth to love. Patience gives birth to more patience. Trust inspires trust. This is how the world works. If we wanna see love, respect, civility, fairness, if we want to see these things, we have to give them back. We have to put them out into the world. We have to be willing to take the stand and do the right thing, whether they come back or not, because we believe that ultimately they will eventually come back. If we keep putting that out, we will not be able to get back the anger long-term. Maybe initially in the forefront, but not long-term. It's kind of like that old, have you heard that old proverb that you reap what you sow? If you sow anger, if you sow fear, if you sow resentment, 
you're going to get more of that back. It's the same concept of a lot of people like to talk about how the world is a mirror and we see in the people around us and in the world around us, we see a reflection of what is inside of us. If I'm operating from a place of fear, I see fear everywhere I look. If I'm operating from a place of bigotry and hatred, I see bigotry and hatred everywhere I look, even when, when it's maybe not there, or maybe, maybe I ascribe that even when that's not what was intended. I see it and I interpret it that way because that's what's coming out of me. You reap what you sow. If you're sowing love, if you, you will see love. If you're sowing civility and respect for all people, regardless of whether they agree with you or not, you will start to see that back. Maybe not right away. When you're gardening and you plant seeds, let's say you plant an apple tree and you plant some apple seeds, like seedlings. We're not talking like you go to the plant store and get a tree that's already grown and growing. This is an actual seed. You put it in the ground, you're not gonna see anything for a while. And when you do finally start to see it coming through the ground, you're not gonna see apples for a while. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but you will eventually see that. And our task is to be the patient loving gardeners who grow those things that we want to see and keep putting out into the world, keep planting the seeds of what we want to see, and we will eventually reap it back. The other thing that we can do practically to start to put this into action, we kind of already touched on this, but practice the pause. This is not a new concept. This is not something I made up. There's even memes going around on Facebook where it literally says practice the pause. It's a very old concept in many different religions and philosophies around the world, and it's so true. That's why it's a common theme. We need to pause the reaction and we need to take time to think through and analyze what we're trying to create and how are we going to communicate something so that we can create that. How do we communicate something through love? How do we communicate something through trust and respect? How do we communicate something that will bring about the good things that I wanna see in the world, not continue to sow the seeds of hurt and resentment and anger? So here's the really important question. A lot of the discussions I've seen on the internet lately have been around people who believe that they are in the right and they genuinely want to create good change in the world. They just have differing ideas about how to do that and what that looks like. So how do I stand up for what I believe is right while still respecting other people? The key is to adopt responsibility, not resentment. So what does that mean exactly? Resentment feeds on power and it breeds destruction. So when I say it feeds on power, what I mean is it is never enough. With, when you resent someone, when you're angry at someone, when you're bitter at someone, another great word for resentment is bitterness. Um, when you feel that, you can't just let something go. And no matter how much power you gain over someone or something, it's never enough. You always want more. No matter how much somebody pays for something they did, it's never enough. You always want more. No matter if they apologize, you can't just accept the apology and move on. You want them to pay for it. It's always going to feed on that power, feed on wanting more, wanting vengeance, wanting to destroy things. It breeds destruction. What that looks like is tearing things down, overthrowing power structures, overthrowing communities, overthrowing traditions taking away things from people, taking away rights, taking away privileges, taking away wealth, taking away opportunity, taking away, taking from you to give to someone else. That's how our, our twisted thoughts when they're trying to convince us, that's how our reactionary emotions convince us that this is okay to do. It's okay to take that from someone else. It's okay to insult them, to take their dignity because we're giving it to this person over here that they insulted, right? never works that way. It's not a good strategy and it ends up hurting everyone and it's never enough because if you take from them and to give to someone else, you're just gonna wanna keep taking more. It never feels like you get enough. That's a mark of vengeance and resentment that we never feel like we have enough justice, that they've paid enough, that there's enough that we've overthrown. This is also where I like to think of the phrase, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Sometimes things need to be thrown out. Sometimes things suck and sometimes things are corrupt and we need to fix it. Sometimes we need to tear down some of the structures, but there should be a difference between just raising everything to the ground and taking away the things that are not working for us and changing them. We don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater because valuable things will be lost or damaged. We want to keep the good 
and change the things that we don't like. Responsibility fosters my power and it yields creation. So what this looks like is, first of all, it fosters my personal authentic power, which is what Potion Yarns is all about, right? That's what we do on the Color Cauldron. That's what we talk about is empowering me. And it's about you, the individual. It's not about your group that you belong to, your religion, your political ideology, whatever. We, we care about you, the individual. What can you personally do today to feel empowered? What can you personally do today to have the best life that you can, to create the life that you want, to create a life of meaning. What are you doing to do that? This is about my personal authentic power. And it's also about creating. So um, as fiber artists, this is something we can understand probably better than just about anybody. This is what brings us together, right? The joy of creating, the love of creating, the beauty of creating. It's what lights a fire and inspires all of us. And that's what's so spectacular about this community that I love and do not want to see go away. I love to see that creation. My business slogan is create your own magic. And the first word is create because that's what's so important. And I frequently do posts on my Facebook and Instagram about inspiring people to make something, do something, create something because that's what gives our life meaning. That's what makes our life worthwhile and beautiful. What can we create? What can we leave behind? What can we do today to make today awesome? It can be something as simple as creating order in your messy house, to creating an incredible business that helps people, to starting a nonprofit that brings about great change in the world. It could be something huge and massive on a large scale or something tiny, like baking something amazing for your family from hands that communicates love and care and nourishes them. It can be something so, so simple and something so, so huge, usually all at the same time. Creation is amazing. When we take responsibility, we create things. So here's an example of what I mean. Um, using knitting as my guide. <laughs> when I was starting to knit and starting to get into it like hardcore, I'd been knitting for a little while, but kind of off and on, then gradually getting more and more into it. Finally, I got to the point where I was ready and excited to try knitting my first sweater. And um, I started in on this sweater for my husband, who at the time was my boyfriend. And I picked kind of a tricky pattern totally within my range, but I'd never done anything like that. And it was huge because he's a big guy. And um, I had a few mistakes early on, but I ripped him out, restarted, got going. I got about three quarters of the way through the sweater and realized I'd made a huge mistake quite a ways back. And it wasn't gonna be just tink out a few stitches and be okay. It was gonna be a major overhaul. I'd had a couple problems earlier in this sweater and every time I had a problem, I went to my big sister because she was knitting longer than I was. She was much better at fixing errors. She was much more patient about it and um, she could spot it and diagnose the problem a lot easier than I could. I was still learning how to do that. And so she'd helped me with some of my earlier errors and I happened to be visiting her in her apartment in St. Louis at the time. And we were knitting and I discovered this mistake and I got so angry and so discouraged. I literally threw the sweater, needles and all, across the apartment in a fit of pique. And she was like, okay, you need to take a break. And so she graciously volunteered to take a look at it, find the error and help me fix it. And what ended up happening was she, she tried to like kind of show me what was wrong and I was so angry. I was like, I freaking, I, I don't care. I, I don't care. I hate this thing. I'm, I was ready to throw it in the trash can. Thankfully, she convinced me not to, but she took out the mistake. She unknit several rows. She got everything back on the needles. She got it picked back up, knit a little bit, and was like, okay, I got you back on track. Here you go. This is where you are in the pattern. Go. I finished the sweater. It looks amazing. He still wears it today, even though it's getting a little bit ratty. That was like over 10 years ago. I don't know how old it is now, but um, it's great. It was awesome. I felt so proud of myself when I finished the sweater. But... I didn't feel really, really proud of myself until I learned how to fix my own mistakes. I continued trying to knit sweaters and the next couple sweaters, I learned how to diagnose and fix my own mistakes. My sister isn't always around to help me when I need her. My mom, who also helped, some, helped me with some of my errors early on when I was first learning to knit, she's not always around to help me with my errors. Sometimes I have to be a big girl and do it myself. And I learned pretty quickly that I didn't feel that good or accomplished when somebody else picked out my errors and fixed it for me. 
but I sure as crap felt amazing when I fixed it myself. So even though it was much harder, even though it required a lot more work, intense focus, and the not fun, just put your nose to the grindstone and do it, just rip out those 20 rows and put your stitches back on the needles, it made me so much a better knitter, so much a better person. It cultivated patience. I started to learn to forgive myself for making mistakes. I started catching mistakes before they happened. I started getting better at reading and checking my knitting. All of these things made me a better person and a better knitter. And then I got to the point where it was no longer throw the sweater across the room in anger because I made a mistake. Sometimes I'm still like, oh, you're kidding me, I made a mistake. But it's not the catastrophe that it used to be because now I know how to fix it. I'm empowered. And you know what? The more that I fixed my errors, the more sweaters I knit, the more socks I knit. I finally got brave enough a couple years ago to try my very first steak where you cut up your knitting after spending hours knitting a Fair Isle sweater. I cut up through the middle of it and guess what? It's awesome and it's my favorite sweater now. So responsibility, doing the hard things, taking control and doing it yourself yields creation. It's only gonna make you wanna do it again. Once you come through it, you're like, I feel like a rock star. I'm amazing. Look at the thing I just did or created. Look at this thing I fixed. Look at this thing I made. And it makes you want to do more. And guess what else? It makes everyone around you want to do more. Everyone around you sees when you rock an amazing Fair Isle sweater and they're like, holy crap, that's cool. I want to make something with my hands. Think about, are you in any Facebook groups for knitters online? Or maybe you have a knitting group locally that you go to. Any, any kind of group online or in person that you meet with other knitters or crocheters or spinners or whatever your fiber craft is. You meet with other people that love fiber and do the same kind of craft as you. I'm gonna use the example of a Facebook knitting group because I'm in several and this is where I find a lot of inspiration. So when I'm in one of my Facebook knitting groups, if somebody posts a picture of this amazing shawl that they just knit, and it's just gorgeous and stunning. You know what the response is? Everybody's like, holy crap, that's amazing. You're awesome, you're amazing. I wanna be amazing, where can I get the pattern? Oh my gosh, this inspires me, I'm gonna go knit this. Oh my gosh, just went and bought three patterns and now I'm gonna knit them. Everyone gets so excited and first they praise the person who did it, they recognize and honor the work they did, and then the immediate next step is, where can I get this pattern? What can I do? Or, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. I just started my first Fair Isle sweater and I can't wait to see what it looks like. Yours looks amazing. Everybody wants to do it. They might do the same thing as you or they might do something totally different, but your success, your accomplishment, inspires people to want to go do it too. That's what it's like in life. When you take responsibility, it yields not only your own creation, but the creation of everyone around you because then they are like, that's amazing, look at what she did, that's so cool. I could do that too. I wanna do that too. I wanna be that important. I wanna be that amazing that I can take on the responsibility and show other people how to do this. I wanna create that kind of change. I wanna have that kind of impact. I wanna have that family. I wanna have that life. I wanna have that success. They're gonna do it too. So what about the discussion about people having rights? How can everyone have equal human rights when we disagree so much and we can't even agree on what those rights ought to be or who ought to have them or when they apply and when they don't, et cetera, et cetera? How can we, how can we agree on that? The first thing to recognize is that rights are impossible to maintain when I choose resentment over responsibility. Resentment does not respect the rights of people who disagree. It respects vengeance under the disguise of justice. It pretends to want justice, but it really wants vengeance. It really wants to make people pay. It really wants to hurt the people that have hurt us. It doesn't want true justice and it doesn't want peace and resolution, it wants vengeance. It does not respect the rights of the people who disagree. So they can be taken, if you disagree with me, you don't deserve your rights. And we can take that away. And when you agree with me, then you can maybe have your rights back if I decide so. That's, that's not true justice. That is vengeance, and it's unfair, and it's impossible to maintain those rights. Because rights are a two-way street. It has to be, what's good for me has to be good for you. And we have to respect each other enough to allow each other to have those rights, even when we violently disagree. <laughs> Responsibility, on the other hand, values true justice and believes that everyone's rights should be protected, especially the person I disagree with. This is what makes responsibility the hard choice, not the easy choice. So 
Responsibility says, I want you to have the same rights, even when I detest what you're saying, even when the thing you're saying is absolutely abominable to me. I will not stoop to taking away your voice or your rights or your chance to create your own magic just because I disagree with you. Um, it Really, we shouldn't be trying to use rights as a battering ram against people to change their opinions. First of all, it's never going to work. Remember how we talked about um, how anger breeds more anger and fear creates more fear? Well, vengeance creates more desire for vengeance, both in you and in the person that you are wreaking vengeance on. And taking away the rights of someone is putting you on a very slippery slope that someone else will take yours. It's not ever going to be a good way to go. You really need to resist that urge. It's so easy to feel that urge to want to do that, to want to silence the voices that are saying things we find detestable. It's so easy to want to do that. But it's not healthy and it's not good. We need to accept the responsibility to be willing to listen to things that are hard to hear, things that we don't like. That doesn't mean we have to agree with them. It doesn't mean we approve of them. It just means we have to be willing to listen to it and willing to give them the same respect that we would like them to give us listening to our opinions and our voices. The last thing that I really want to remind you guys of is that resentment creates a victim mentality in which I feel powerless and I feel like I need a savior to come in and save me to fix my problems. This is what happens a lot of times when people look to their church or religion, they look to their spiritual leaders, or they look to a political movement, a political candidate, or a party, or an ideology, or they look to a moral code set up in some kind of group or something outside of themselves. They're looking for someone else or something else to come in and save them because they feel powerless. So they abdicate responsibility and they want someone else to do it for them. But guess what? When somebody comes in to save them, they're going to only feel more resentment because we weren't created to be powerless and sit around and let other people fight our battles and other people create the world around us. We were all created to want to go out and do great things, to create things, to make our own way in the world, to have confidence and power and hold our head up high. And so if you're feeling powerless and someone else comes in and saves you, they're proving that you're powerless and you're going to feel more powerless, which is going to make you feel more angry and more resentful and more bitter and more hurt and feel more like everyone else has it better. Everyone else is taking advantage of me. It creates more resentment. It creates more fear. Responsibility, on the other hand, instills confidence in me. Remember how we talked about it yields creation? It makes you want to do more things. You have a, a success or a win in one area where you took responsibility. That gives you so much more confidence and drive to have another win, to do it again, to do something greater. It just, you keep climbing higher and higher the more you win. That's what responsibility does. It turns me into my own savior. I can create my own power. I can create a life of meaning. And you start to see, I do have power. I can make a change, even a small one. Anything that I do to make the world a better place is a change in the right direction. And from that small little powerful place, it grows and expands. And then you can actually help other people. You start by helping yourself, then you can help other people. And you'll inspire those other people to help themselves and then help other people. And it just grows and grows and grows and soon we're all helping each other and that's how we create a better world. That is how we create positive change in the world. And you can do that absolutely. In fact, I think you can only do that by loving and respecting other people, by wanting to genuinely make the world a better place, by not worrying about getting even, getting vengeance, getting your own back, punishing the people who hurt you, but by seeing everybody as hurting people like you. And if you help yourself, you can help other people and they can help themselves and they can help you. It's this beautiful web of interconnectedness that we all have with each other. See the people around you as a mirror. When, when you feel hurt by something somebody else did, look for the hurt inside them because I'm, I guarantee you it's there. What can you do to help ease that hurt? What can you do to ease your own hurt? 
When you take responsibility for hurt, when somebody else hurts me, if I'm coming from a place of responsibility and empowerment, yes, I'm gonna feel hurt. Sometimes I need to process that, that's okay. It's okay to get mad, to get angry in the moment as long as I don't act on that reaction. As long as I take that inside, process it, deal with it, and then I create, okay, this person said something really hurtful to me, or this person did something. This person hurt me. They took away an opportunity. They maybe took away business from me, or they, they hurt someone in my family, or they hurt me, or they hurt my reputation. Instead of retaliating and wanting them to pay, I can take the position where I say, you know what, this person hurt my reputation. So I'm gonna go out and rebuild a reputation. I'm gonna do good things. I'm gonna do great things. I'm going to share love. I'm going to try to be positive. I'm going to do whatever I can to rebuild a good reputation. And I'm not going to take the opportunity to cut them down in the process. That goes so much farther than you going out and saying something against them because people are watching and they're gonna be like, wow, person A over here is talking really bad about person B. But person B has nothing bad to say about person A. They're too busy going out and helping the world and saying beautiful things and creating wonderful things and taking responsibility for their own life. Who do you think is going to make more of an impression? Who do you think people are going to want to be like? Who do you think people are going to be inspired by? You can choose to be the person who's going out and creating or you can choose to be the person who's trying to destroy. I know this video has been a little bit long, but I wanted to wrap up with one final thing that really made an impression on me this last week and I wanted to share it with you. I heard a quote recently, um, and I had to look up her name because I kept forgetting it, from a gal named Polly Murray. I think that's how you say it, Polly Murray. Um, she wrote in 1945 about her aspirations. She was a young lawyer and civil rights activist. And she was talking about um, destroying segregation and breaking down the boundaries between people groups in society. And she had an incredible quote that really touched my heart and I wanted to share it with you guys. She said, when my brothers try to draw a circle to exclude me, I shall draw a larger circle to include them. Where they speak out for the privileges of a puny group, I shall shout for the rights of all mankind. How large will you draw your circle? I really love this because it is very, very easy when you feel excluded, when someone draws a circle that keeps you out, or they try to punish you for the way you believe or the way you look at the world or anything else, something as simple as something you can't change, like your skin color or your heritage or where you grew up or what gender you are or your expression or identity, it can be really, really easy to feel that hurt of someone excluding you and to want to exclude them too. So they kicked us out, fine, we'll go start our own group. Fine, we'll, we'll go do this thing over here and they can't come be part of our group. Fine, we're gonna say bad things about them. We're gonna make general, someone made a broad generalist a description or assumption about a group that I'm in so I'm gonna make all these broad generalizations about their group too that's only going to break down into further exclusion 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 what we need to do is draw the bigger circle we're not going to try and exclude them we're going to include them draw a bigger circle around them and us and all of it no longer is it them versus us it's we it's all of us we come together, we draw the bigger circle, we include them, we embrace them, we step towards the people that are fighting against us. I would love for the Color Cauldron to become a bigger circle, more inclusive, to draw in the people that are fighting against you, to draw in everybody. I want all of us to be kind to each other, but I'm not going to retaliate. If you're unkind to me, I'm not going to retaliate to you and be unkind to you. If we're unkind to each other, we're never going to be able to connect. We're never going to have a community. We're just gonna break down and further splinter. So we need to draw our bigger circle, be more connected, be more loving. I hope that really helps and encourages you guys. I'd love to know what you think about it. Feel free to leave me a comment below. I do appreciate respectful discussion, so please let's keep all name calling out of it. Let's keep all um, hateful comments out and just keep it very um, civil, civil discussion. Disagreement is fine, but civil discussion, please. Um, I may not get to answer every comment uh, individually. I will try my best, but I may not always get to. Sometimes I get really swamped, but I, I do read the comments and I love to know what you guys think. And uh, I'd appreciate it if you would leave me a comment and feel free to share this video with whoever you think needs to hear it. And um, 
yeah, I just, I wish all of you, no matter where you stand, no matter how much you agree with me or disagree with me, I wish all of you a beautiful, creative, wonderful, and empowering week. It is now time to cast off. Love you.